position. I think he chaired it at some point, and Ronnie seemed to know him so well and was giving me this whole thing about uh, Hassan Mal, you know, aspects of him that I might not have known. And then just before the main meal was served, he disappeared. And I said, Ma, what a sacrifice. He's going to miss a huge meal. But that's Ronnie Cashel's. He's made sacrifices all his life, so I think that was a small one. But what I want to say is I was at a meeting once uh, that was being chaired by Judge L.B. Sachs, and somebody in the audience asked Judge Sachs, will South Africa go the same way as Zimbabwe? And Judge Sachs thought for a while and he said, no, believe it or not, whatever is going on here, and with all this corruption and everything, remember we have people in this country who are honest and who are brave. We have an amazing civil society. And you know that we have had people across the spectrum, from the poorest of the poor, from the ones of, who are accorded the lowliest status, right up to people who have served this country with great sacrifice and who speak truth to power. And here is somebody who does that in the most noble way. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to listen to Judge Al Thank you. Thank you. Well, that. And if Hassan was alive, sorry, if Hassan was alive, you'd have been very proud. Thank you. Are you remaining here to take questions? No. Or not? Okay. You, you do that. Yeah. Okay, no, it's fine. But you can do that. Fine. Okay. I don't know. Oh. Yeah, I'll stick it in there. Right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here with you. Thanks for the very kind words, Prof. Um, what I intend doing is perhaps speaking for something like 30 to 40 minutes so that we have at least 20 for discussion. You can bombard me with your questions. Um, so we'll try to aim for that, at least the 20 minutes. I was told we could go past 2 p.m., but uh, I'm not going to do that. I think, uh, given age, on my part, not yours, <laughs> and um, the extent of schooling you're going through, uh, to tie and carry on and on can be counterproductive. So let's get into a title which was thrust on me, um, Jacob Zuma or President Faust. Uh, there was no time to really change it to make it, I think, a little bit more sensible. Um, but it it's emerges from a phrase I used at least four to five years ago about the dispensation we're living in, and I talked about the Faustian pact, um, which might not be popular with everybody if we apply it to 1994-96. It certainly is popular with um, Professor Saint-Peter Blanche of Stellenbosch, who, after reading his book, Lost in Transformation, it began to occur to me when I read it in 2012, that we had given away far too much in 94, 96. And it's towards the end that I'll come to that because I think it is a very important challenge to one Cyril Ramaphosa if he's going to get things right. Um, given the wonderful sea change that has occurred in this last week, and we can almost feel the fog lifting, even as I speak here. And it certainly lifted with me as I saw that result from the NEC meeting. Uh, rather, from the, the election, yes, at the ANC conference, um, which saw Cyril Ramaphosa coming to the fore. But in fact, um, the way I apply the Faustian Pact in my book, uh, on sale in the foyer, not a bad price, a simple man, <laughs> the enigma of Jacob Zuma, um, is that I do see in the very real sense 
Jacob Zuma as Dr. Faust and the Gupta brothers as Mephistopheles, the messenger of the devil who comes and offers fame and fortune in return for Faust's soul. Um, a very interesting German classical tale that given rise from the 13th, 14th century to this idea of selling one's soul to the devil. Um, and in Christian countries, of course, this is always used very much, but it has its analogy in Islam and every religion. Um, so let me, first of all, in, uh, begin on, I want to begin on a positive note and end on a positive note because it can be quite a, a depressing tale. Um, South Africa, we hear it over and over, is a resilient country and South Africans are resilient. And I'm an optimist who is on that side. I agree with that. And I think if you look throughout our history at the darkest points, um, we see this happening time and again. So even during the reign of Jacob Zuma, I felt that although it could have spelt enormous disaster, that um, there was always what Ramaphosa will say is looking at the glass and saying it's half full, not half empty. But I like metaphors, hence the Faustian pact, and I love sporting metaphors. Um, not all of us are enamored with sports. Some of us blokes go on far too much. I was like that at school before I began to read a little. But it's left its uh, character traits with me. And when I see the emergence of two fantastic bowlers in our cricket team, and the latest one is this man in Gidi, and you can see the West Indians now utterly envious of what we've produced. And the way we turned the tables on one of the best cricket teams in the world, the Indians, after what we've gone through sporting-wise and cricket-wise, we see this happening over and over. And if you go back to politics, of course, the emergence of the Mandela after the dark apartheid days, I'm not in all, at all totally enamored with J.C. Smuts, but um, if you're looking at it from the point of the white South Africa that was being born in 1910, and the rogue Cecil John, who resided here in the Cape, and I'm not taking the part now of Roads Must Fall, um, just read Olive Schreiner about Cecil John Rhodes, and... Um, after that corruption, actually, and the emergence of that deal, and it was a deal between Smuts and the Brits, state capture isn't something that's just happened the other day with the Guptas. And I also disagree with, there's a title in your program talking about uh, the, the end of the apartheid days and that state capture that was being talked about. State capture takes place in various guises throughout history. But anyway, I'm, I'm starting on that note because a lot of the things I'm now going to enter is a field of depression and darkness. So hold on to your seats. Um, I knew Jacob Zuma back in the old days. I actually knew him in Durban um, in 1960. I'd arrived to work for Lever Brothers, no less from Johannesburg, and I joined the uh, Congress movement and went along to meetings as a young person. There were a few of us, um, and Jacob Zuma, four years younger than me, he's born exactly, it's an amazing year, Zuma, Chris Harney, Tabo and Becky, Paolo Jordan, they all born within months of each other in 19... 42. I'm a lad of 1938. Um, and there was this young 18-year-old who was very uh, an activist, 
with the trade unions, very neatly attired always, always engaging, nice young man, and um, we recruited him into the armed struggle and sent him out the country. That's what you get for looking like a really nice, young, active man in the ANC, that he was keen to do that. He was arrested on his way out with 45 others and ended up across the uh, waters on Robben Island for 10 years. Um, that Jacob Zuma, as a young person, impressed people very much. Uh, no formal education, and he had, he had taught himself the rudiments of reading and writing. Uh, it wasn't simply Robben Island where he gained that. So it showed a positive aspect, a person who wanted to get on and was intelligent enough to be able to do so. So if you for fast forward to 1982, uh, 1980, I arrived in Maputo, capital of Mozambique, uh, from having been serving the ANC in exile after having fled the country in 63, so based from London to Dar es Salaam, all the frontline states had moved from Angola, been deployed from the camps there where I lectured on politics and history and the like, um, and morality and our standards and so on and principles, to Mozambique where I met Jacob and we began to work together in a committee restructuring, reorganizing the underground in South Africa and creating links with people inside, having people trained outside and sent back, both for armed action with MK as well as for political work and activity. He was a wonderful person to meet. We got on like a house on fire, um, engaging on the surface as this country saw him and many people fell for him and not just the ladies, in that respect. Um, we worked closely, we jumped the fence into Swaziland from Mozambique, uh, met people in Swaziland in very dangerous times, dodging not only the hit squads from uh, South Africa, but the police in Swaziland, and at times even bullets. Brave person for sure, but it didn't take that long, in my case a couple of years, the doubt began to arise um, through numerous clues. Nothing is being invented here. So what I say can be and is, um, it, it is reinforced by the opinions of others in exile, the fact that we didn't speak about this publicly was because we're an underground organization and then back inside the country there's the whole question of the elections, of creating a new government coming to power and so on. So one kept the dirty linen inside. Uh, in terms of the way people began talking about him and what I saw, in short, was somebody who actually cleverly covered up the fact that he was incredibly conservative, uh, patriarchal, and with it went superstitions and aspects that made one wonder what actually went on in his mind. Um, there were aspects of his ethnicity and in relation to that what we noted from time to time was that he would have private meetings uh, with people from his province and that wasn't the minority groups but those from his tribal group and those from other backgrounds in South Africa and within the ANC were pretty disturbed by this. It was actually um, discovered that in the work that he had been doing before I came and joined him to do political work, that um, 
he had been very selective in sending weaponry out of Mozambique, smuggling back into the country, in the main into the hands of people in the rural areas of his province. And those who were working with him um, were very disturbed and had made reports. And that particular structure of his was dissolved. So there was this ethnic aspect, there was a very backward aspect, and I'm not just putting down tribal culture as backward, but that's another lecture, of course. Um, the question was, and remains, as you see Zuma speaking in his home language to people within Zululand, that there is a very marked focus on so-called Zulu culture, which people who know it say he twists. So there was this ethnic factor. There was the question of secrecy. Now, of course, we were involved in clandestine activities, but Zuma had clandestine activity going on within our clandestine activity. And that's for, I've given the example of the smuggling of weapons. He would meet people from his province. And at first, I defended him when people said to me, you know, this man's tribalistic. And I said, well, a lot of us here are from Natal. Um, and anyway, he's a politician and he needs his constituency, etc. Um, so he's got to look after that. And people would laugh about this and say, well, Ronnie, you'll see. It's more to it than that. There was a fourth aspect, and that related to the gender factor. Now, we were all living in very tense times, almost like the resistance movement during the war. Um, I'm talking about Europe there, or in any times of that kind of tension, where male and female relationships can flare up like that. And that happened, and a lot of us were single people away from wives, family, and so on. So I'm not being precious in coming to the point about Jacob Zuma uh, being a predatory male chauvinist. And it was seen and talked about. Seldom, if ever, reported higher up to people like Tambo, etc. cetera. Um, that's an error that was made and lessons to be learnt. But it's something about life as well where you don't readily go up the line and say, oh, so-and-so is up to this and that and the next thing. It did mean that a culture developed in the ANC, and I'm sure this has happened in other movements around the world and in history, where people covered up for each other. And very often, a leadership decided not to come down too heavily, because often in the leadership, there were people behaving in a similar way, or even carried within them certain ethnic factors of consciousness and the like. Um, there are books written about the ANC in exile. Uh, which try to make out that aspects of corruption of various kinds, including the ones I've referred to, but also including the question of, um, of gaining benefit in relation to the small change around, in relation to the fact that we were a community and we had a ration system and we had people who were in charge of organizing the petrol, or um, seeing and choosing who would travel abroad for a conference, or simply in terms of the groceries and the meat you received uh, at your residence. So this, these were communities in poor countries from Angola to Zambia and Mozambique. And I would defend the fact that there were quite small elements of corruption 
uh, on the basis that that's what you find in society anyway. Um, I'm admitting that it was there, but there are some authors in this country and academics who have said that therein lies the germ of corruption in our country. But you're talking about 2,000 people in exile who come back and are swallowed up in a sea, some might say, of corruption or of acquisition or of capitalism. I'm not wanting to dwell on this. It's a subject to consider, but uh, there are various books um, that you might come across. And I have had debates on this with such authors. I would say that Zuma is a product of South Africa, even though we begin to see those manifestations are referred to in exile. He's not learning that in exile. He's um, exhibiting certain traits. And we saw these traits with many people and with many young people who came out in 76, who were a generation younger than the Zumas and Hanis and Ronnie Casrilses, who came out in 76. And by then, were even more materialistic, by the way, um, than our generation had been from the 60s. There was something of a difference which we could see between the 1960 generation and the 76 generation. Acquisition, commercialism, commodification, and so on had become much greater in South Africa from the 50s, that particular generation, where there was, certainly was a greater degree of, of morality. Perhaps the families were more cohesive. There was still the influence of church or religion. And of course, that's pretty strong in African uh, society. Um, when, we, when we came back into the country, the flaws that some of us saw in Zuma became much more evident. And it became evident for people in our country interested in these uh, luminaries or uh, powers to be, and even to the media. Zuma, if you recall, very quickly became involved with Shabir Sheikh although the trial only takes place from 19, uh, sorry, to, uh, 19, um, sorry, 2002. But it goes back to 1990 plus, one month, two months. Um, and in relation to the question of how corruption began to rear its head, within a movement that was going to become a government and a ruling party, um, what people began to see, or what one should realize, is that those from exile, unlike a Ronnie Casrills or a Joe Slovo, by the way, who in his case, his wife had a bit of money from abroad. In my case, I had relatives here. Um, and, and people like us had those middle class connections. We didn't have bank accounts and we didn't have savings, all of us from the prisons or from exile. But if you were from the African community, you'd never had a bank account. There was no property in the family and you were at this incredible disadvantage plus the fact that unlike those with a nuclear family system, you had this incredible extended family. Um, and you had then people like Jacob Zuma and many others targeted by the likes of the vultures circling, such as Shabir Sheikh, and there are many names. I don't want to start rolling them off my lips. 
in case anybody has connected and I get sued. But they've been in the press innumerable times. So of course, I'm playing a game with you when I said all that. Um, the Reddies, all sorts of, of, of characters, both black and white and Indian and Jewish and the like. And uh, Jacob Zuma and certain others were clearly seen as easy targets. Many were rebuffed, those who came clinging or swooping. So not everybody just succumbed, but there was a slogan emanating out of greater Africa, and that was, it's our turn to eat. And I know some characters who were there who were actually better off than a Jacob Zuma, and here I won't make na mention names, but who were not satisfied with um, having a middle class level of life, of beginning of, as we did earn as we came to Parliament, and that's not a bad wage at all, but who simply used the slogan, it's our time to eat. And the fact that I've given 30 years of my life, half of which might have been in prison, it's now the turn for the damn whites of the society to pay us back and we will reap what we can. There were people like that and Zuma certainly fell in with that sort of lot and there were a good many people who did not. But Zuma fell in with alacrity and um, he was soon up to his eyebrows in crooked deals, as we know. However, let me just mention this. It was quite strange, because initially in the, me the media were, were focusing on this kind of behavior. But by the time a clash or rivalry is evident between Jacob Zuma and Tabo and Becky, you remember him, um, the media s and, and public, to quite a degree, began to side more with Zuma and began to buy an alibi he was using which said that there's a conspiracy against him, which was why he was being dragged into the Shabir Sheikh trial, mentioned in relation to that. And I would say if you look back at that history, and the media, members of the media have referred to it as well, including yesterday, ENCA's program, whole day program, that the antipathy towards Mbeki, which was building up in the ANC, and which Zuma used very cleverly to oust Mbeki and come to power, also affected uh, commentators, people in the media, and the like. Now, there are various theories about this. There's the idea that he was a clever black, that um, middle class people in South Africa, and, and, and certainly those abroad, uh, and those in higher circles here who first liked him, got to a point where the dislike grew. Um, that he was too cold and remote and too much the intellectual. Within the ANC, Mbeki clearly had made errors and had made enemies of the trade union movement, Kusatu, and the Communist Party. So in short, enemies of the left by the move from Mandela and Mbeki, both of them, turning towards what we call neoliberal global free market economics. In short, the left viewing it as a lurch by the ANC, leader and Becky, um, to the right with regard to the economic policies of the country. You'll remember that the Reconstruction Development Program, which was more Keynesian and redistributive, was changed for gear, which was not, and was seen to be very much the free market 
and all the ills of the Washington Consensus. The time doesn't allow me, and I'm not an economist, to go into that area. But those who are interested, read St. Peter Blanche's 100-page book. There are other books that you will find uh, that he mentions. If you want to look into the economic factors of the choices available for South Africa. I'm going to end on that, so I want to come back to this, but I'll end on that in terms of two or three minutes at the end about why a Keynesian social democratic economic approach is the, is the one that could save us. And if we stick with the Washington Consensus, which was from Mandela and Mbeki, the way we lurched then, and then, for better or worse, whether you agree with them or not, the left in the guise of Kusatu and the Communist Party, their critique of Mbeki. But there were others within the ANC fold, particularly, who were nationalist. And I would say, if you don't mind this, it, these labels make for easier way of getting to points with the right wing of the ANC rather than the left. So they tended to be more narrow nationalistic in their approach. And amongst them, and I'm not saying it was only them who were corrupt, plenty of corrupt people have been found in the trade unions and in the Communist Party in our country. But there were a great many in the ANC of this ilk. And what was happening is that a group, that, a, that an institution, not the Hawks, but the Scorpions, were basically investigating from Shabir Sheikh to Zuma to Mac Maharaj and a number of others. And Gwaka Ramaklodi, you can add and add. And they basically felt that Mbeki ought to step in and tell these people to desist. I worked with Mbeki then, and I know very well, and as we would all agree, and want this of any of our leaders, that in fact there should be no political interference in the prosecuting authorities, in the NPA, the investigative arms, uh, in SARS, and so on. The state capture organs that Zuma had less sued and got control of. So I know that Mbeki, and as an intelligence minister, I'd said these people are, are prepared to, to um, go in for a plea bargaining, or they're saying that he should know that they have not been involved in any of this kind of activity, blah, blah. And Mbeki's position was simply, well, it's up to the prosecuting authorities. But this particular number of people who Ramat Lodi and Tony Yengeni called the walking wounded, they, in coalition with all the forces that had become anti Mbeki, including the left, were very skillfully played by Zuma. So that Mbeki gets ousted and Zuma gets the crown and becomes to the acclaim, actually, of the media in 2007 at Pulakwani and 2009. And I think even then, a great deal of people in the public, even within some of the opposition parties, thought that it's better to have this affable man, the simple man of the people, which is how Zuma put himself across. Hence the title of my book, A Simple Man. Um, and he was very engaging with this, and he could clearly pull people into that sort of ambit. So his rule, his 10 years, if it's going to be 10 years, and I think we're all hoping to see it come to an end, maybe in the next few months, who knows, maybe sooner, um, that uh, people got behind him and were pleased to see the end of Mbeki. So I've tried to indicate that there were flaws in Zuma in exile and that these were exhibited back home I mentioned the Shabir Sheikh episode, which still lingers on, but then add to it, 2005, there's a rape allegation 
by the daughter of a comrade of his from Robben Island who is with us in um, Swaziland and who by then had long died. And Zuma took advantage of her. There was an attempt to put the blame on me and say I'd manufactured a honey trap because I knew her, as he did, from exile. Um, and certainly in that period of time, 2005, a lot of people, and particularly in the liberation movement, believed that there must have been a honey trap. Um, we then recall how horrified people were when Zuma exhibited all aspects of his backwardness as a male predator, the gender aspects, um, the way he played his culture, I'm a proud Zulu man, and if a woman is aroused by me, it's my duty to satisfy, etc. He is very fortunate to be found not guilty in a court that reeks of male law and male conservatism. And if you read the judgment, you see this. And if you follow that case again, you'll see how the learned judge who was promoted by President Jacob Zuma later, um, how he allowed aspects of that trial and uh, evidence uh, to be established, which normally isn't accepted in a rape trial. Uh, and that is the, the person who makes the accusation, in other words, the victim, the victim's past sex history, which was laid bare. And this was in relation to a young girl who had had a very difficult life um, and had great psychological problems and had, as a young kid, been sexually involved and clearly abused and there were rape allegations and in ANC inquiries, those who had been accused by her had been found not guilty. So the judge had allowed aspects of this to be brought to the fore and also the fact that she did not cry out when she was being raped. And the learned judge's view was that if a woman does not cry out for help while being raped, then she was not being raped. Uh, a backward position which took into no account the fact which has been prevalent in so many cases and as far as the psychology of this is concerned, and that relates to the power equation in officers. We've seen what comes out of both Britain and America and other countries, and in politics, and where a woman freezes. That was the nature of that trial, so much so that the learned judge, Zach Yacoub, of the Constitutional Court, had uh, made a very interesting uh, opinion um, in relation to the fact that that type of evidence should never have been allowed uh, and that, as he said, even a prostitute has the right to cry rape. Um, Zuma got off on that basis and even then my colleagues in the Communist Party, ANC, etc., were prepared to trust him and to elect him in preference to, in, in preference to Thabo and Becky. Um, the other aspects of the flawed Jacob Zuma that we had seen in exile uh, are many. I'm going to simply here, because the time's passing, refer to the secrecy factor. Zuma became head of ANC intelligence and counterintelligence in exile. And this was one of the aspects which made many of us very concerned about his judgment and measures he took and his behavior. Because we had examples of people in MK who we felt were absolutely trustworthy and carried out their, um, their activities 
in a exceptional way, um, who he took positions against. And there were ethnic considerations. It was felt in relation to that. And a lot of such people fell foul of our security apparatus, which certainly was responsible for many abuses connected with him, and not only him. But he had, as I refer to, from Maputo, the secret way of dealing within a secret organization. And one of the biggest abuses of power under Zuma, in terms of state capture, we know very well what it means in terms of the Treasury, in terms of our um, SARS revenue service, in terms of ESCOM and the like. But there's also the aspect of the security structures of our country from the National Prosecuting Authority to the Scorpions now, the Hawks, um, and the whole question of investigation, prime intelligence and the like, and the intelligence portfolio and institution I once commanded. And that has been Zuma's capture there of these institutions and insertion of his own people from ministers who have patently been incapable of the job, taken from nowhere, like the current intelligence minister, Bongo and Mahlobo before him, the various police chiefs, etc., etc., and the heads of the Hawks and the MPA people pliable, people who would be loyal to him, people who he could um, utilize. And we've seen now for several years, side by side with the state capture of the financial institutions, the capture under Zuma now of the intelligence and the security aspects, so that the NPA were no longer really in the business of, of tracking down Zuma's friends, from the Guptas to other cronies, and the country suffering enormously as a result. Um, time has gone pretty quickly, so I, I'm going to accept that everybody has been following the, the chain of horror that we've been through in relation to the Guptas, state capture, the abuse of power, the selection of ministers um, and heads of department who would do his bidding, the firing of those who stood by the constitution and the law from the Proven Gordons and the Ivan Palais at SARS, which had been working so well, and we're now trying to investigate not just Zuma's friends, but Zuma's own finances himself, uh, which is why these people were so quickly and thoroughly cleaned out. But um, we therefore were getting to the position of really worrying what next. That was Zuma going to defend himself, uh, prevent himself from ending up in a prison cell? Um, was he going to be able to protect his ill-gotten gains, his fortune, whatever's in Dubai and elsewhere, cronies in the ANC and government, the Gupta links, etc., or would he have to face um, the judgment day? Which was why we are clear that he puts in place running for ANC presidency, his former wife, and there's Cyril Ramaphosa and a number of others um, in that contest. And it was really absolutely so, so close, the difference being something like 330 votes between. And I think we all heaved a sigh of relief, and certainly the mist lifted in the hope and belief that we can see better days. 
So I, I want to end on the point that there can be better days. We're watching what Cyril Ramaphosa is determined to do, which is going to give us our ideas of how serious and strong he is. It's very difficult because the narrow victory means that within the ANC's top bodies, it's been almost 50-50. Uh, and the people who were with Zuma are especially, and, and, and very, very powerful indeed, linked in especially to places like the Premier League provinces of Northwest, of Free State, of Mpumalanga, and of KwaZulu-Natal. So there was something there that sounded the sound bells for the ANC to decide enough was enough. I'm not suddenly saying everyone saw the light, turning over a new leaf, and now they're going to behave like good boys and girls. The main thing was they were clearly seeing that Zuma was the liability and would take them all down in 2019. That's politics. It's now up to Cyril to see whether he can handle those who are still there, and people like Ace Makushula and Didi Mabuza are very, very worrying figures indeed and very powerful. So you put yourself in Cyril Ramaphosa's shoes. I'm delighted he's there. I don't agree with everything about the way he would handle things in terms of the economy, but certainly to stand by the law, the rule of law, the constitution, to clean up the stables, to ensure that everything from ESCOM to SARS to the police and intelligence services and the National Prosecuting Authority are there to do the job they should do. And on the very promising note for all of us, there's nothing like power and the smell of power to make people stand in line. So suddenly, all those who were so pro-Zuma are leading the chart to support Cyril because, of course, everyone wants to ingratiate themselves to the new pole of power and get a good job. And one's hoping that he's going to, and I, I believe he will, that he's a technocrat, that he will choose as many good people, men and women, as he can, if possible. But remember, he's got to do a balancing act with this. So there's that particular factor, and we've got to look at this very closely powered with knowledge and information um, and the lessons to be learned. So whether Cyril's a good guy or not, the point is it's not just the individual, and we've seen this, whether you look at Mbeki or Madiba or, or Zuma, it's got to be a leadership group and they've got to be serving the people and we've got the judiciary and the media and civil society in this country, which is very robust, business groups and so on, to ensure, and all of us as the public belonging to civil society, to be on our toes. And if there's anything suspicious that occurs, if Cyril does not put strong people in as public protector, ESCOM chair and ESCOM board, and that's looking good, the new national um, uh, head of the prosecuting authority, that's the next big test for Cyril. As a deputy president of the country, he has to put in place, Zuma's trying to challenge it, ahead of the National Prosecuting Authority. It's a key. That's going to explain to all of us so much about Cyril's rule. I did say that I wanted to mention something about the economy, and I referred to St. Peter Blanche. And let me, in a couple of minutes, just simply say this, that under this wonderful man, Mandela, um, we were able to come through a very difficult process, fraught with all sorts of dangers and violence, possible civil war. And I absolutely supported him there and still do in hindsight, in the road we took of the reconciliation, etc. But in terms of the economics, take yourselves 
and I do from the subject of Blanche critique. And there, there are other economists, and we had economists from Britain and parts of South Africa and abroad Canada who helped the ANC forge what I'm calling the Keynesian, or it's a post-Keynesian economic approach. That basically means the type of economy that we saw in Europe after the Second World War, from Britain to, to uh, Europe in, in, in uh, absolute on its, on its back and, and so on. And that's one which focuses more on the redistributive side, on making jobs, putting money in people's pockets, um, an approach of that kind, it's, it's a social democratic approach, it's building massive infrastructure and the like, it's the Marshall Plan, it's the New Deal of Roosevelt, and this has gone out of flavour by the time of Reagan, uh, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, where you then had what was called Reaganomics. And that's the trickle-down effect, it's um, very tight fiscal control, it's it's an argument and a position where the state should not intervene, leave it to the free market. That's the way to create the jobs and, and run the economy and, and get the economic growth. But it's failed miserably here, and it's failed internationally. Um, what I would argue, and it's not me taking decisions, and I don't do it in a dictatorial way, I would say that the choice from Mandela that was made then, the key problem when we changed, and some Peter Blanche uh, and Jay Naidu in his book, he was the RDP head, and many ANC people, including myself, will tell you, we had very open discussion on the political nature of change, on the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, etc. But the economic one was behind closed doors, and it was greatly influenced by Oppenheimer and Rupert uh, talking with Mandela and our economists, and there were very few, Trevor Manuel and, and Mbeki, and um, big business and corporates, both in South Africa and abroad. And this is how we came to the gear factor. Um, instead of the reconstruction and development program, Jay Naidu is bitter in his book about this. And he says that he loves Mandela and, and he praises Mandela to high heaven. But in his book he says, that's the one part where Madiba behaved like Joe Stalin. It was done in secret. We were presented with this as our economic model. And we were told that there was, it was not negotiable. We had to go that route. Otherwise, the Western countries would not do business with us. And we accepted that without a debate. So if I'm talking to you good people now, in advanced age where you can play a marvelous role in society still, with civil society, believe me, and I'm not flattering you, it's to look at the economic choices, the only two kinds. It's the free market Washington consensus, with something like the Swedish-Norwegian model. It's not the red flag of Ronnie Casrills and full-blown socialism. But I believe it's one that starts with putting the people, and therefore, it's not us, middle class. We're part of it. But you put at the centre the absolute poverty-stricken and poor. And we people, part of that, say the formula must begin with education for these people, with proper housing, with all of the aspects which will lead to the jobs, which will create a better economy and help our children and grandchildren sleep in a secure, prosperous South Africa. It's very basic. There's a socialism to it, but if you're Christian, you must think back to the egalitarianism of Christianity's foundings, and the same if you're an Is Islamic or, or, or from the Jewish faith or whatever. It actually is a simple choice. The other one is the one that sees, it's not 1%, it's not the 1% having 
50, 60 percent of the world's wealth. It's actually 0.1 percent. When you look at the figures, it's the billionaires, and they, they are the ones that basically run governments that are behind the invasion of countries, the in incredible unemployment, the fact that jobs move as has happened under this new Washington consensus from industrial countries, including our own, and Britain and America, etc., to parts of the world where you can get cheaper labor. Um, and, and that's part of the reason for the immense unemployment and horrors we're facing, but also the horrors that our, our climate's facing. And here we are in a Cape Town where we're all dying for a drink of water. So, on that note, may I end? And I'm sorry, but we might just have 10 minutes to go to two. But they had said to me, if you wanted to stay for another five minutes, we could take questions. If you want to clap, you can clap now. Thanks, thanks. So, thank you. OK. So. There was the first hand, and here's the second hand. Um, what I think I'm going to do to make it quicker is I'll answer, not as sometimes we do take five questions and answer, I find that you then forget too much. So I've got two hands here, and then a third and a fourth, and a fifth. Okay, can you just remember one, two, three, four, five? Thanks, we'll leave it at that and, and, and start now. So the lady over there, do you want to mention your names for the sake of the audience or not? Okay. But just try and speak loud as it's possible. On Zoomers. Okay, if I was in the NEC now, what would my position be on Zoomers exit and package? The sooner the better. And no question that he should not be facing a charge. That's an ideal, and I would like to see him very much facing the charge. And I would say that to the NEC, it's 80 people or so, and I say, comrades and comrade Zuma, you wanted your day in court. It's your chance to clear yourself. And comrades, Comrade Zuma must stand to face the charges, so we give this as an example to, to the whole country. That would be my position. Thank you. And you see, when we talk about civil society, one of the ways you can express yourselves is letters to the paper. And others is in whatever associations you belong to or clever children you have and I'm sure you do have, and et cetera. But let's always find a way of actually putting it into some form of action. Thank you. It's still lingered in, um, when Shabir Shaikh was convicted, why didn't uh, um, Trevor Manley order an ins or institute and order into his uh, finances? He did, that the end of Yeah. So, when Shabir Sheikh was, um, was charged and found guilty, why didn't the Minister of Finance, Trevor Manuel, order an audit into Shabir's, into Zuma's? I, I think um, something should have been done. And let me tell you what should have been done. Zuma should have been charged then and there. And you'll recall that Bulalani Nguka, who was the head the National Director of Public Prosecution, this NDPP guy, um, he called together, strangely, just black editors, a big error, this business of playing to color in the country. You start doing it and you just carry on and it, it bites you in the end, as, as AAN7 bites back. But um, it's... <laughs> I wouldn't know the facts, uh, if there are, but Bulalani basically says there's primary fascia evidence against Zuma, but it's not going to hold. So we're not charging him. To me, it looks as though this was a political decision, 
that uh, to avoid embarrassing Zuma, this point I made about the problem of the ANC in exile, we began to create this culture of protecting comrades. And you know, we're back in this country, and it's us blacks against all, all liberation revolutionaries, against these dreadful whites, including whites like you, and this dreadful DA, that kind of mentality. Um, so let's go a bit easy and um, leave it and not act. Very possibly that signal came from even higher up. And if it did, that would have been, I was asked this on a, interview one day, uh, what, what do I think would have been Mbeki's greatest regret? And I would say it was that Zuma was not charged in 2002 with Sheikh or in 2005, because then he had to carry the burden of that, um, th that act against Zuma, of dismissing him, which is why the elements of the ANC, Communist Party, etc., uh, ganged up against Mbeki. And can you imagine what that would have saved us? Which is why we've had these eight to ten dreadful years and Cyril must not be allowed to make such errors. We must speak up if we see that weakness. So we've got three, three, four and five now here. Thanks. It was you. Thank you. Yes. I think here and then there was one and another one. Right? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So this question is, how did those who knew Zuma for so long worked with him uh, in the struggle and then in government? How did he respond? Did we raise our voices? Perhaps we could add to that. I raised my voice in 2005 in uh, a meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party when I saw that they were all moving behind Zuma and for Zuma. And I spelt it all out along the lines we're discussing here, obviously, it, well along those earlier lines of, of, of my presentation. And I could see it was going down like a lead balloon. Because in politics, when you see the pulls of power, um, then what kicks in is why people, ordinary people, so often think that politics is such a dirty game that people suspend their, their, their judgment, their real judgment, and just go with naked self-interest of getting a job and being recognized. That's that half of it. The earlier half of exile is more complex even, and it relates to a whole amalgam of a resistance movement or a revolutionary movement and so on, fighting a life and death struggle um, and not allowing your opponent to see what weaknesses you might have and unless you Mao Zedong or Stalin not putting people in your midst who are showing weaknesses up against the wall and shooting them. Um, you know, it's a rough way of responding to that, and I'm not saying that's what should have been done, because often when you give in to that rule of the gun, kangaroo courts, you put up the, the honest people and shoot them down. But there was this way of handling things within our movement which tended to be kind to people, um, of rather seeing what had created the problem. So here the guy is back in the country and he's got, at that stage, two, two wives, a dozen kids, uh, no money. Um, he's having to pick up small change from the Shabir Sheikhs and people like that. And the Mandela thinks that in a really kind way, we've got to rescue Jacob Zuma from this. And gives him a million rand, raises a million rand. 
and thinks this is going to solve Zuma's problem because a million rand should have wiped out the debt. But that kind of guy, you give them a million, it's like giving a drunk a nice shot of whiskey. They want more and more. That's what happened with him. Then the next... Sorry, raise your voice, please. I didn't, I'm not hearing. The economy, yeah. No, absolutely not. Um, so the question was that the gentleman was saying uh, the way the economy has been run down and uh, virtually destroyed, down to zero growth, 0.7 growth, etc. Um, surely somebody like Zuma, and of course he's, he's got a cabinet there, um, should see what they're doing is wrong and how do they still allow this to take place? Well, there are much cleverer people than Zuma around the world who have presided over the, uh, the, the smashing of an economy through wrong policies. But what you need to add here is the greed factor. And one's got to be careful in saying it's an African problem because it's not. But we have seen, whether it's Asia or Africa, Latin America in an earlier century, because the, the Latin American countries, as you all know, became independent from Portugal and Spain. Those empires crashed 150 years before the Brits and the French, etc., of the last century. And out of the new independent states, um, We've seen in most cases the similar trajectory of initially some aspect of growth and then the economy really hitting the wall. Um, and we've seen some very gross manifestations of this. And people very easily will point to Ghana, Uganda, Kenya, very often, etc., uh, Zimbabwe, of course. And, and say it's all about our turn to eat and it's all about greed. But actually, and again, where this Afrikaans professor who was a Buddha bonder at Stellenbosch, St. Peter Blanche, can really teach us something about the economics of the country and world economics going back to the empires that fell and the independent states that emerged. And the thing to bear in mind, and maybe this explains Zuma to a T, is that you have a political elite coming to power in all these countries. But the economy, it's termed neo-colonialism, because the economy in these continents has tended to remain in the hands of the corporates, big business, the mining houses in London and Paris and Washington. And that's where the economic control and power and strength lies. So the new elite are having to govern and at the same time to make money for themselves by battening down on very limited resources, and it's actually the only resource they've got because the rest of the economy is dominated from Europe and America, is, is the state fiscus. And they're hungry and they eat like termites into that. <laughs> and then there was a third up there, ne next question, a fifth, thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry, just again, a bit louder.
Thank you. That's a brilliant question. So, the, um, the, the, the point that's been made, I think we're going to have to stop at this point because it's getting on for 10 past. Uh, that's a great question. Thanks so much. The ANC is to blame for allowing Zuma to ascend and then to carry on. Remember how the ANC and the parliamentarians protected him. Um, so blame lies there. And what do we do now? How do we prevent this happening again? It's a key question, which I alluded to to a certain degree. And you're quite right. I blame the ANC, absolutely, and don't let them off the hook. And to make amends, and this second time round, with a populace and an electorate who's now alerted, we are a very politically aware country, this country. People of all shades of education and background. And we've seen this happen. It's a wonderful learning experience. The elections coming around now, we must raise these points so sharply. Uh, and we can see that the ANC has been running in panic, which is why they changed from the Zuma protege and chosen Cyril and come to back him. And Cyril's got to learn this. We're at a point where the ANC hopefully can learn. And all political parties, all of them must be aware that we are an electorate that is becoming aware of, and this is where education and political education comes in so much. Because if you're living in the rural areas, you're not on t watching TV or reading the newspapers, and you might be victims, easy victims, of the demagogy in your mother tongue. Those people badly need to be made aware as well. So it's a huge question for the whole country. And we've just got to do what we can and get involved together, not sit on our own. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.